All right, welcome to New Hope Church, and we are in this series, Don't Do Life Alone. And if you would, pull out those message notes with the fill in the blanks, and if this is your first time or first time you've been here in a long time, this is what we've been doing. We've been talking about Do Not Do Life Alone in the first in this series. Pastor Roger spoke about Do Not Do Life Alone in the area of relationships. He talked about friendships and the importance of it. Today is the beginning of small groups. Pretty awesome. And then we talked about do not do life alone in the area of religion. Do not do religion alone because so many people, they try to fulfill the law of God without the corresponding love, and it fails every time. It just <laughs> draws you into lifeless religion. And then we talked about don't do thoughts alone, that our life always goes in the direction of our strongest thoughts. And we talked about how we need the Word of God to correct our stinking thinking, and then we need friends to help process what God's doing in our life and the Word of God, and then we need the friendship of the Holy Spirit. And so today we're going to talk about a subject that it is undoubtedly uh, centered in on a certain group, and it's always a challenge as a pastor to make sure that the message applies to all the people. And this one, admittedly, is towards parents, <laughs> but it's called Do Not Parent Alone. And now if you are not a parent and maybe you're single, should you check out? Should you start surfing the web, checking out how old Tom Brady is and, and you know, doing something else? No, I believe that every principle in this message today is applicable to all of your lives. Whether you're married, want to be married, you're not a parent, you want to be a parent someday, or you just want to have some people you influence in your life. So today is do not do parenting alone. And let me tell you that the opinions always change, don't they, <laughs> when it comes to parenting. Now, when Trish and I first became parents, really all we had to contend with was two opposing opinions, and they were called in-laws. <laughs> but today we have the Internet. <laughs> and when it comes to things like... Um, I don't know what kids will eat now. There's all of these opinions. If you introduce these foods, they're, they're going to have anaphylactic shock and they're going to have allergies for us if they could chew it. And if we could do the Heimlich on them, if we were a little early, it was fine. Okay? And there's all of these opinions as when to potty train, how to potty train. We just figured we never saw a 30-year-old that hadn't figured it out and that it would happen sooner or later. And then the, one of the biggest things that I've noticed as I've watched some of you, that there is this big opinion as sleep schedules. You know, there's all these books on that. For us, we just dragged them around. They passed out. We threw them into bed, and, and they woke up, and they, now they're adults. They, they did just fine. But the fact is, there's always these opinions, <laughs> and they seem to change. I read this on the internet, and it's from a woman, and I want to preface it by saying it, I did not write this. <laughs> but what she, she noticed was kind of the change in life when you have kids, and, and this is what she said. She said that when you find out you're pregnant, you wear your maternity outfit immediately, <laughs> like you want everybody to know, right? And then she says, when it comes time for the second child, then you wait until you begin to show. You're not so excited, and so you wear your maternity outfit when you begin to show. And she says, by that third child, your regular clothes are your maternity clothes. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, <laughs> it just seems to go that way. And then she said, you know, when you go out on date night, you and your husband, on that first time, what do you do? You tell the sitter, now, 
I'll call back. And then you get down the road three minutes and you call. Is everybody okay? And you're pestering that babysitter. But second child, you, you almost forget to turn on your cell phone before you go out the door. But by that third child, you give strict instructions and you say, don't call unless they're bleeding. <laughs> right? You know, I don't want to be disturbed. <laughs> and then she said, Ultimately, almost every kid will swallow a coin at some time in their life. And she said, that first child, you absolutely freak out. Rush them to 911. Take them to the emergency room because they're not there fast enough. And demand an x-ray right now. Second child, you wait patiently until it passes on through. <laughs> and by the third child, you demand it taken out of their allowance, right? <laughs> you want something back for, for you. Come on, now help me out. You want something back for your investment. And so techniques, opinions about how to parent, they absolutely change and evolve out there over time. But there's one thing for sure, that God's word, God, is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so for a moment, and for the rebroadcast of this message in the future, I want to talk a little bit about those non-negotiables, those principles that can be found in the word of God that it doesn't matter who has an opinion, mother-in-laws included, that we can grab upon those principles and raise our kids successfully for God. Are you with me? Now, we need to agree today, what is the definition of doing parenting alone? And I would give it this definition. You might want to jot this down. It is this. It is when consequences and rewards are the primary means of good behavior. I'll say it again. When consequences and rewards are the primary means of good behavior, it's like at least they didn't kill anyone. And if the glove fits, we must acquit. That's a little OJ. Okay, forget I said that. Okay, <laughs> I never said that. Well, what I mean by that is that you are someone who is more interested in behavior modification than you are in spiritual formation. And even their behavior modification isn't focused on the benefit of the child. <laughs> that you just don't want them to embarrass you in public. That you don't want them doing anything, screaming out that puts the, sh the spotlight on you as a bad parent. And so what you do is you focus on their external behavior rather than trying to mold their inward depths of their heart. Now, no one would ever admit <laughs> to having done that, would they? No. But there are some telltale signs that would tell you that you're parenting alone. <laughs> And one would be that you're bribing, and that's a fill-in for you. If you've ever found yourself saying, here, have an ice cream cone, but please just be quiet, quit screaming, or you see those parents that just shovel out the iPads or the iPhones just so that they'd be quiet, may I submit to you that perhaps you're not trying to form the depths of their heart, but what you're looking for in their life is conformity. Would you just please be quiet? Here, have this. So bribery is one telltale sign that you are doing parenting alone. And I would say the other, if you've ever found yourself repeating. <laughs> I mean, you're saying it a thousand times over, and you get a little louder, and then finally you explode to get the kid's attention. That is a sign you may be doing parenting alone, <laughs> that you are teaching that child actually that they can ignore you <laughs> until you explode and go absolutely berserk, and then the authority goes over to them, and God help us. <laughs> so it's very dangerous to do parenting alone, and the reason why it's dangerous is that it can lead us to a, a failure point with our kids. 
And let me say this, that I would have to admit to having done <laughs> at some time everything that I just mentioned. And sometimes I take a look at my daughters, they all love Jesus, and I wonder, how did they ever make it without total trauma? <laughs> how did that happen that they made it? It wasn't just because I had all the answers and I don't pretend or portend to have them. And let me tell you this, that the enemy is not on your side. And if you feel like you're a failure, if you feel like you have not done the right things and you've made mistakes in your parenting, let me be the first one to tell you that there's nothing that you've ever done to blow it in your life that the grace of God cannot cover. But you do need to make some decisions going forward. And I would say that it's never too late for those of us that are grandparents to see God's hand move through our lives because we have applied God's timeless principles in our life. And the problem, I would say, is honestly that no one ever taught us how to parent. I can remember when our first child was born, a little redhead. <laughs> she had a mohawk, and we put her in the car seat, strapped her to the back, and as we were going home, Trish and I had this conversation, like, what do we do now? I mean, they trust us with this child, and I'm like pretty much telling my wife, don't trust me alone with this creature. I, I'm a, I, I will kill it. <laughs> I do not know what I'm doing. And so we need to reach in to God's timeless principles when it comes to parenting, not alone, but with God on our side. And everybody's got an opinion. I actually went on Amazon, put parenting into the search and found 240,253 different opinions out there. But today we're going to look at some very, what I would say, some bottom line non-negotiables that I believe that if you own these for your life, that you are going to make an impact on your kids and on the next generation. And the first one is this. If you're taking notes, hopefully you are. I should say as you're taking notes, the first one is who you are is what makes an impact. Look at that scripture verse in your notes. It's Hebrews 7, 9. And I have to admit to you, the first time I read that verse, uh, it actually freaked me out. When I actually read it, and understood the gravity and the responsibility of the impact. My, how I lived life and who I was would impact not only my kids, but my children's children's children, if Jesus tarried. And let me preface it by saying this, that this verse is actually a commentary on a meeting that happened 2,000 years prior. It was the meeting of Father Abraham, remember him? Father Abraham had many sons, right? He met this guy named Melchizedek, and his name meant uh, uh, the king of righteousness. That, that there are many people like me that believe he was what was called a pre-incarnate logos. What does that mean? That he was actually Jesus in the flesh 2,000 years prior to be him being incarnated as Jesus in Bethlehem, born as a child from Mary and Joseph. He was actually Jesus on the scene. Now, you may not buy that. There is an argument on that issue. But in any case, he represented God as Abraham bowed to this king, this high priest, Melchizedek. And you know what he did? He tithed to him. If you don't know what the word tithe means, it's a principle in the scripture where he took one-tenth of his wealth, we still do this today, and he invested it into the kingdom of God. Now, with that as the background, I want you to hear the scripture. It's in your notes. It's Hebrews 7, verse 9. It says this. One might even say that Abraham's descendants, and they were the Levites, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham because when Melchizedek met Abraham, now get this, here's the freaky part of this verse, Levi was still in the body of 
his ancestors. In other words, are you ready? Strap in your seatbelts. Follow along with me. Levites, the Levites. Now, who were they? They were not Abraham's children, but they were Abraham's children's 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 children. <laughs> what this verse says, that when Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, the Levites, 2,000 years later, were still being blessed because Abraham's faithfulness and generosity. That absolutely blows my mind. Why? Because the Levites were still locked up in Abraham's body. Now, if you're a single here today, if you're someone, even a high schooler, you dream of someday, you might not admit it, you might not say it out in public, but if you were to be asked, do you plan on ever being married someday? Why, yes. Do you ever plan on having kids? Yeah. Listen here. What you do today, your faithfulness, <laughs> writing out the tithe check, that's what Abraham did. Your faithfulness, your continued honoring of God, not only will bless your life, but your children's, 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 children's. I mean, that just blows my mind. That what you do in your life will not only impact your own life, but the generations to come. It's who you are. Are. Now catch this verse. Deuteronomy 5.8 says, and God tells his followers, don't worship idols. And it says, I'm most jealous God. I hold parents responsible for any sins they pass on to their children, to the third, and yes, even to the fourth generation. Ouch. <laughs> and then it goes on to say, but I'm lovingly loyal to a thousand generations, to those who love me and keep my commandments. What I find is that righteousness is many, many fold more powerful than evil. That you can undo the power of the enemy by being faithful and generous. Wickedness only affects two, three, maybe four generations. But if you live for God, you're going to affect up to a thousand generations. That's how powerful doing what's right and loving God, being a person that lives for him, accomplishes. Now it goes on to say, in this, in this scripture, it says, lovingly, he's loyal to a thousand generations of those who keep my commandments. And I would say that, hey, it's up to the Holy Spirit and to the obedience of each person, each of your children, whether or not they serve God. But man, can you have an impact by just who you are. Now, I read this about a great revivalist named Jonathan Edwards years ago in a Moody publication, and they studied 150 generations of Jonathan Edwards, and then they contrasted it with one of his contemporaries. His name was Max Jukes, and they found in the New York prison penal system, they found, uh, I think it was, let me see, 42 people in prison that they could trace their family tree to Max Jukes. And so this is what this article said. Let it soak in. In comparison, Jonathan Edwards' godly legacy includes one U.S. vice president, three U.S. senators, three governors, three mayors, 13 college presidents, 30 judges, 65 professors, 80 public officers, 100 lawyers, and 100 missionaries. Now this guy, Max Jukes, who was... A, uh, an atheist. Max Juke's descendants included seven murderers, 60 thieves, 50 prostitutes, 130 other convicts, 310 paupers, 2,300 years uh, lived in, in poor houses when you add them all together, 400 who were physically wrecked by alcoholism, drug use, and it's estimated that Mac, Max Juke's descendants cost the state in old-time dollars, $1,250,000. Now, we learn from both Abraham, and we can learn from Jonathan Edwards that who you are makes a great impact on your children. And so what you need to decide is basically just who am I? 
you've given your life to Jesus, you need to make that determination that you're going to be a faithful and generous person. And God will do things that you cannot read in any of those 240,500 and whatever books on Amazon. Somebody give me an amen there, would you? Now, the second thing is this. It's not only who you are, but your children can be impacted by your heart, but they're also watching what you do and what you say. They're watching you, whether you realize it or not. Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your heart. And then it says, impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk on the road and when you lie down and when you get up and you tie those symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your houses and on the gates. And so we need to not compartmentalize when it comes to raising our children for Christ. You don't compartmentalize, like I've got the church Barry, and there's the pastor Barry, and then there's the Monday morning Barry. No. Jesus is the whole picture. So how do we do that? How can I make that practical for you as it relates to raising your children? And the first thing I would say, we'll break it down, is I think that you need to be intentional. That this scripture says that we are to impress our values upon our children. And so that means that we need to decide beforehand what values we're trying to impress upon our children. And so I think that it's very important that we intentionally, what we say and do, impresses upon their life that things like worship and giving and serving are important so that we can instill this deep down in their hearts. And I believe that uh, Trish and I, she's actually in there with the children today, that we both had a great leg up, that we had a great, uh, just uh, something that, that others may not have when it comes to having this impression upon our hearts. And the reason is we watched our parents come to Christ. And it was powerful. <laughs> Pastor Tom, he's in the service. He's in the back row, okay, right now. Don't look at him. But most of you know him as the silvered hair. Very, very wide. I mean, no one is a better counselor than he is. He has a, a gift of mercy that if any of you have ever come to him with an issue in your life, you know that that wisdom just like comes out of his mouth. I mean, he's built just hundreds, literally hundreds of churches with his bare hands. He's planted a church. He's pastored for years. I, in fact, I've told my wife this many times that when I die, I want him to do my funeral because he is the best person that could ever, ever officiate a funeral. I mean, people come to Christ by the bucket loads because of the mercy that just exudes from him. If you were to do a Hollywood movie, you would cast him as that guy that conducts the wedding, okay? But my wife remembers him when he smoked, <laughs> when he swore a little bit, <laughs> when he was a deacon in a church but didn't have a personal relationship with God. But then she saw the Holy Spirit just totally wreck his life so much so that he gave his, in fact, we were ordained in the same year. He gave his adult life to the ministry. And we had a benefit in that many of you, you know my story. I won't say it all over again, but my dad was a hopeless alcoholic. The Holy Spirit came into our lives and angels actually showed up at our house when my dad's ready to commit suicide. And I watched not only the physical transformation as God healed him, from alcoholism, gray hair turned black in a moment's touch of God in his life. But then I watched, and you know why I got to know Trish? You know how I got to know her? Our parents were the last ones <laughs> to leave church. <laughs> and she, a good-looking girl, with, uh, along with the other family, that are, they're waiting to lock up the door. Why? Because we watched our parents give sacrificially. They both had ministries. My dad had a ministry to alcoholics. Uh, Tom was my first junior high leader. 
In fact, I was sitting in the back row of that middle school class, like we just sent off ours, and uh, I was a class clown. Can you imagine that? Okay, you, you don't imagine that, but I was kind of messing around in the back row, and Judy's ready to slap me upside the head, and God stopped her. And I call her a scary prayer lady because God does speak to her in many ways. And God said, hey, be careful how you treat that young man. How would you feel if one day he becomes your son-in-law? Well, how's that going to be? Uh, Trish was a senior when I was a sophomore. She wouldn't give me the time of day, but miracles happened, okay? <laughs> and I wish she would have told me that. It would have helped me in the time of decision. All that should I buy the ring. She told me that years after we were married. But we watched our parents have their own ministry. They were in a small group together at times. We watched miracles happen in their life. We were aware that they tithed and more. And we watched God do amazing things through them. And what a great benefit it was for us. And so I think you need to be very aware of what you say and what you do. In fact, my parents, when we would go on vacation, are you ready for this? They made us go to church on Sunday when we were on vacation. I complained back then, but, you know, somehow they got that. I mean, those of you that are here today, somebody put it in you. You're here on a snow day, for crying out loud, <laughs> when other people looked out the door and said, mm -mm, somebody put that in your heart. And my parents put that in my heart. And I don't want to be judgmental or harsh to anyone or anybody watching this today, but I think we need to ask ourselves, is what we do, is what we say, reflecting to our kids actually what's in our heart, that we love Jesus. And they did a study. Are you ready for this? Take notes on this one. They did a study of families that attend church, Christian people with kids, and they found that right now the average family attends church less than 1.5 times a month. And uh, I look at that, I know we have a changing culture, busyness and all, but I think we have to look and ask ourselves, are we communicating to our children what's really most important in our lives by what we say and what we do? And so how do we pass on our values? First is be intentional. Second is informal. And it's this, that because our values are caught and not taught. Listen, Jesus did not bring his disciples together and say, class, here's the syllabi. Let me teach you how. No, he said, follow me. In fact, you will witness Jesus' prayers as you read the gospel. What did he say? He looked to... The, the sky when he prayed, and he said this, I only do what I see the Father doing. Later on, you'll hear Paul say to his spiritual sons, follow me as I follow Christ. It can't be taught in a class. I think we need them. I think we need small groups, but it's really about catching and not teaching. Actually, they go together. Deuteronomy 6 says this. Talk about these values of yours. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, when you get up. And I'd add when you're riding in the car, when you're on your way to the mall, when you're walking down the road, when you're playing in the park, when you're clicking around the web, that God needs to be a part of what you're doing, and it needs to be more than just formal. In fact, I would say that you need to recount your history, and your testimony. In fact, you find it in the scripture. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider thrown into the sea. I mean, they're saying it over and over again. And the very reason they had holidays and ceremonial dinners like the Passover was to remind every year that that is our story. And if your kids aren't tired of hearing about how God came through in your life, you haven't told them enough. In fact, my girls to this day will roll their eyes when I say, have I ever told you? And when they say yes, I tell them again. That's how you do it. It's informal. You tell them, you tell them what you told them, and then you tell them again, you tell them again, and you tell them again. And how often 
I found my kids saying, I've got a philosophy on that, and I have a story about that, and that's because the Bible says that, and this is what God showed me. We need to do it until we get it down into their very spirit. We need to tell them and tell them again. So be intentional, and be informal, and then lastly, be inspirational. And I would say, don't preach it. <laughs> don't shove it down their throat. Do not, you, do not use the Word of God for manipulation. Don't let the Word of God and, and, and Jesus and His judgment be part of that governor of their life. But make it alive. Be life-giving to your kids. Is, is serving Jesus a wonderful thing? Let it be that. And so when it comes time for your young ones to go to sleep, I believe, this is my opinion. Can I give you my opinion today? <laughs> I believe that it's the father that should be having devotions, reading the Bible to their children. And don't do it like it's boring. Don't do it like it's rote. I mean, put some animation in your voice and make it fun. You know, I wish, now that I'm a grandparent, <laughs> I wish that... Uh, I could have those times back, but Hope, my married middle daughter, she doesn't want me laying down with her at night and reading the Bible anymore. I, I, I don't know why. I would love to, but she's not interested. I mean, th if you're a parent today, this is your moment. This is your time. As they grow older, get creative. I know with my middle daughter, she hit 16, and we began to be distant. We did the Dobson thing, preparing for adolescent and talking about sex and things like that. That was that time. And then she kind of got distant from me. And I found this book called uh, 30, 30 Days, Turning the Hearts of Parents Towards Their Children. And in my Facebook Live, I'm going to uh, do that on Wednesday. I'm going to share some of these resources. And it was just the right thing for that time. But it needs to be inspirational. And I'll tell you more about that. Well, this end this way. If you look in your notes, prominent theologian John Westerhoff, and I'll make it quick, identified four stages of faith that we go through. And the first is experiential. That is when a child is watching their parents and they're viewing their experience and they're discovering what their parents believe by who they are, what they say, what they do, and then they begin to say, that is my faith. That's the first step. It's kind of experimental. And the second step is this. It's association. It's where our faith begins to attach itself to the group. Let me tell you that that's why uh, things like, like the youth group, Wednesday night, is so important because peers begin to influence peers and how powerful it can be when they're experimenting and discovering God together. That's why years ago, over 20 years ago, I started Edge Club. If you want to check it out, it's edgeclub.org. And on the campuses all over northern Virginia, students gather together, reach out to their friends. We just got a full-time director. But that's association, peer-to-peer. -peer. Then the third area is searching. And at that faith level, what you'll find is maybe they're gone in college and now they're being exposed to alternative values and different ideas and professors. And there's a lot of godlessness in our culture. And they begin to ask the question, is this really my faith? And then there's that fourth one. And I want you to think about, like, where am I in these four? That last one is owned. That's when you press through all of what grandpa thought and mom thought and what my peer group believed and what the college professors, they said, and now it is my faith. I trust in Jesus. I know him. I have a personal relationship with him, and it's so important that each and every one of us get to that point. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes out there with me? I want you to think about those four levels of faith, and I really want you to reflect about where you land in those stages. Let's pray. 
God, I pray right now, I pray for everyone that is watching. I pray for everyone that is in this room. And Lord, I pray as we think about where we are on that continuum. Lord, I pray that you would help us grow in our relationship with you and that we would think about that. Lord, we're so thankful that you're our father, (laughs) that we can be a part of your family, that your word tells us that great is the love that the father has lavished on us. The word tells us that the reason the world doesn't understand it, doesn't know us, is that they did not know God. So we just thank you that your love is lavished on us as you, our Father. And so, God, we we pray, and Lord, we thank you that regardless of where our heart is right now, Lord, I pray that we would draw deeper to you, that we would find our approval, and we would find our affection in you as God the Father, and that would be what we would discover. And, And Lord, I pray that New Hope Church would be a place where families are being pointed to Jesus. And God, I pray that each and every family would, regardless of of where they are at school or work or in the ballpark, Lord, I pray that we would be a church that's filled with healthy, vibrant families that when the world takes a look at us, they would say, I want to know God. They've got something I don't have. Right now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, there's some of you that may be watching right now. (laughs) You may be in this room and your heart has not landed in the owned place. You don't know God, but you need to. You need to take that move to a personal relationship with God and you're here right now and you would say, I really don't know God, but I know I need to. I want to help you with that. I want to pray a prayer with you as we close. Listen, wherever you are in your life, doesn't matter how much you've done, doesn't matter how far you've drifted from God, it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it, God wants to forgive you. He wants to bring you into his family. And so with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I don't know God, but I know I need to. I want to be a part of that family. Either I've I've not become part of his family or I've drifted away. I'm not going to invite you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way, but that's you today. I want to help you with a prayer. I want to pray with you right where you're at. Would you just lift up your hand right now around this room and say, I need to know God. I need to own this faith. It needs to be mine. Awesome. Thank you for that hand. You can put it down. Is there anyone else? This is your day. Maybe you're watching online. Would you pray this prayer after me? Pray a prayer like this. God, I return to you. Lord, I'm coming home. I thank you that you are my father. That you love me that you sent Jesus so I could become one of yours. So right now I turn from my way of doing things, turn from sin, and I turn my heart towards home. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. And say these important words. Would you just whisper it to heaven? Say, Jesus, be my Lord. Say it, Jesus, be my Lord. Take over my heart. Take over my life. Help me to be an example for you, filled with your power, impacting those around me. And I want to live a life for you. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Lord, we pray for each one here. Lord, as together, as a family of God, we impact this world Let us be reminded that we're your children, filled with your grace and covered by your power. Help us impact this world and let us start with those closest to us. 
And then let us spread this love to everyone we know. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray.